That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. A good day to you speculative art fans and just generally nice people of the internet. This is Bob Crumb. I'm back with another video about possibly what it would look like to have a Disney princess turn into some kind of creature feature monster and have to be hunted by the otherwise antagonist of the film now become protagonist. This time around, we're going to delve into one of my favorite authors inspired by another of my favorite authors, H.P. Lovecraft. So you guys know I've already read from Lovecraft once in one of my videos. I've also read from Poe in another one of my videos. And Lovecraft was influenced by Poe. In fact, in his earlier career, probably overly much tried to sound a whole lot like Edgar Allan Poe, but later found his voice and his voice was absolutely terrifying, but not in the way that you think typically terrifying stuff is like ghost stories or spooky or slasher films or spooky or anything like that. He kind of engaged in a cosmic horror type of thing, which we are definitely going to talk about. And I will definitely read from The Call of Cthulhu before we're done with this whole thing. So I've chosen, based on a couple of the comments, to use Little Mermaid as Cthulhu. There were some ideas about maybe the, the creature from the Black Lagoon, the creature from the Black Lagoon. Easy for you to say, you silver tongue devil. But I really liked the idea of Cthulhu because I'm a huge fan and it's kind of a lot older of a tale. The original story of the Little Mermaid, Ariel, um, actually bears some strange resemblance to the movie that Disney made where Ariel uh, was the youngest of a bunch of daughters of King Triton, the Mer King. And they were all, when they hit 15 years old, allowed one at a time to go up to the surface and check it out and kind of see what they're missing. Um, and then you never be allowed to really go back up there. And on her particular birthday, Ariel was allowed to go up and she was stoked already, having heard many tales of exciting stuff up there. And it's kind of reflected in the, in the film as well. So she goes up, she finds a ship and is watching a birthday celebration for this guy. And the guy is attractive. And so she immediately falls in love with this guy. But she also falls in love with the idea of just being on land with having legs and not being down there anymore. It's really actually the way I kind of like to think of the story because, you know, just falling in love with a dude on first sight is kind of lame. So the party, the birthday party is raging on the ship and a storm comes out of nowhere and begins to just obliterate the ship and everyone on board is tossed and the little mermaid decides to save this prince. So she grabs him up she takes him all the way to shore because she knows he can't swim, got no fins, can't breathe water. So takes him all the way to the shore to where like a temple is on the side of the shore and deposits him there. And he has been up until now very unconscious. So he didn't know he just got saved by a beautiful mermaid. So as she puts him down there, he awakens and there's another woman already there. In fact, there's a few there that are studying at this temple. He immediately assumes that the first woman he sees is the one who saved his life and falls in love with her. I know, super implausible. So she goes on kind of her own little odyssey and consults a sea witch, just like she did in the movie. But in Hans Christian Andersen's tale, she gives up her voice, her beautiful voice, for a potion that she'll drink. And when she arrives near the prince, she'll be able to drink the potion and she will have legs. There's a cost, not just the cost of her voice that she gave up. It will be like a sword passing through your body. That's the, that's the horrible imagery that kind of Hans Christian Andersen wrote into this thing. If you want legs, Little Mermaid, it'll be that painful to get your legs. And then forevermore, you will be able to dance beautifully, but it'll be like you're dancing on the edges of sharp blades, excruciating pain, just to, just to even walk. Another part of the curse from the Sea Witch was not only that she would give up her voice, but also that there was a time limit. There was a timer put on this whole gift of her legs that if she couldn't make this guy fall in love with her, or at least any human fall in love with her by a certain amount of time, 
that she would die, that she would immediately turn into sea foam, and that'd be the end. She does decide it's worth it. <laughs> so she goes up to the shore to find this prince. Basically, after drinking the potion, this little mermaid is kind of just second fiddle the entire time to this person who saved his life. They go ahead, they do some dating and some courting and all this nonsense, but in the end, he really decides that he doesn't want to be with anyone except for the woman who saved him. In fact, at one point, it is an arranged marriage that he's forced to become a part of, and in some kind of delicious twist of weird Hans Christian Andersen irony, he says, I will only fall in love with the woman who saved me at the beach. Unbeknownst to him, the woman who did save him at the beach was actually the princess that he was supposed to marry, and this got all really surprisingly convoluted because the whole time, the actual person that saved him was not a person, was a mermaid, and drama. So much drama. So, the story goes that mermaids live about 300 years, and the humans considerably less, but when a human dies, their, their immortal soul is able to go to the kingdom of heaven. Whereas, when a mermaid dies, they become sea foam, and nothing happens to them. So it is a bleak and empty existence. She doesn't, in the end, wind up getting him to fall in love with her. He is going to go through with the marriage to this other woman who really didn't save him, this princess. And so, knowing that she's going to have to just die in sea foam, her sisters, her sisters gave up something of their own. They give up their own hair. They go down to the sea witch and they cut off all their hair. Which seems actually a pretty pretty simple thing to do. I mean, hair grows back. They cut off all their hair and they get a blade. A blade with which the Little Mermaid can go and slay the prince. If she slays the prince with the blade, she will be allowed to come back into the Sea Kingdom, have her tail back, and not have to turn into foam immediately. And that is a, a far better solution for her, for her family. Uh, uh, sorry, Prince, you get the kind of shaft on that whole thing. So she's given this blade, and she actually is able to go up to him at night while he is sleeping next to his new bride. But she can't do it. She throws the knife overboard, and she jumps and becomes uh, one with the sea foam and just dies. And that's actually the original ending that Hans Christian Andersen wrote. There is another ending that he wrote after that that he was much more happy with, wherein she becomes a daughter of the air immediately because of her good deeds and is allowed to do more good deeds for 300 years to gain an eternal soul and be able to go to the kingdom of heaven, which is super incongruent with the rest of the tale and a little strange that he backpedaled on that one. The original tale had some weight to it and some gravity, a little bit sad. I'm not entirely sure it was really meant for kids, and I'm not entirely sure that there's actually a moral to that tale. I'm going to read a little bit of The Call of Cthulhu, and we're going to see that there is a group of people, not the cultists, who are actually trying to investigate this whole thing. They get themselves a ship. The ship is called The Alert. And they go out into the South Pacific with a bunch of clues and an idol and all kinds of stuff to see if they can find the portal through which this fabled Cthulhu is meant to be birthed back into the world. They know it's going to be a big creature. They um, they don't know like what its aim will be. They're pretty sure it's not nice, but they're still pretty bold about it, and they're going to go do this, and that's where I'm going to pick up the tale. An excerpt from The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft. The aperture was black with a darkness almost material. That tenebrousness was indeed a positive quality, for it obscured such parts of the inner walls as ought to have been revealed, and actually burst forth like smoke from its eon-like imprisonment, visibly darkening the sun as it slunk away from the shrunken and gibbous sky on flapping membranous wings. The odor, arising from the newly opened depths, was intolerable, and at length the quick-eared Hawkins thought he heard a nasty slopping sound down there. Everyone listened, and everyone was listening still, when it lumbered slobberingly into sight and gropingly squeezed its gelatinous green immensity through the black doorway into the tainted outside air of that poisoned city of madness. Poor Johansson's handwriting almost gave out when he wrote of this. Of the six men who never reached the ship, he thinks two perished of pure fright in that accursed instant. The thing cannot be described. There is no language for such abysms of shrieking in immemorial lunacy, such eldritch contradictions of all matter, force, and cosmic order. A mountain walked, 
or stumbled. God, what wonder that across the earth a great architect went mad and poor Wilcox raved with fear in that telepathic instant. The thing of the idols, the green, sticky spawn of the stars, had awakened to claim his own. The stars were right again. And what an age-old cult had failed to do by design, a band of innocent sailors had done by accident. After Vigintillions of years, Great Cthulhu was loose again and ravening for delight. Three men were swept up by the flabby claws before anybody turned. God rest them, if there be any rest in the universe. They were Donovan, Guerrera, and Angstrom. Parker slipped as the other three were plunging frenziedly over the endless vistas of green-crusted rock to the boat, and Johansson swears he was swallowed up by an angle of masonry which shouldn't have been there, an angle which was acute, but behaved as if it were obtuse. So only Bryden and Johansson reached the boat and pulled desperately for the alert as the mountainous monstrosity flopped down the slimy stones and hesitated flounderingly at the edge of the water. Steam had not been suffered to go down entirely, despite the departure of all hands for the shore, and it was the work of only a few moments of feverish rushing up and down between wheel and engines to get the alert underway. Slowly, amidst the distorted horrors of that indescribable scene, she began to churn the lethal waters, whilst on the masonry of that charnel shore that was not of earth, the titan thing from the stars slavered and gibbered like polyphemy, cursing the fleeting ship of Odysseus. Then, bolder than the storied Cyclops, Great Cthulhu slid greasily into the water and began to pursue with vast, wave-raising strokes of cosmic potency. Bryden looked back and went mad, laughing shrilly as he kept on laughing at intervals till death found him one night in the cabin whilst Johansson was wandering deliriously. But Johansson had not given out yet. Knowing that the thing could surely overtake the alert until steam was fully up, he resolved on desperate chance, and setting the engine for full speed, ran lightning-like on deck and reversed the wheel. There was a mighty eddying and foaming in the noisome brine, and the steam mounted higher and higher. The brave Norwegian drove his vessel head-on against the pursuing jelly, which rose above unclean froth like the stern of a demon galleon. The awful squid head with writhing feelers came nearly up to the bowsprit of the sturdy yacht, but Johansson drove on relentlessly. There was a bursting as of an exploding bladder, a slushy nastiness as of a cloven sunfish, a stench as of a thousand open graves, and a sound that a chronicler would not put on paper. For an instant the ship was befouled by an acrid and blinding green cloud, and then there was only a venomous seething astern, where... God in heaven, the scattered plasticity of that nameless sky spawn was nebulously recombining in its hateful original form, whilst its distance widened every second as the alert gained impetus from its mounting steam. That was all. After that, Johansson only brooded over the idol in the cabin and attended to a few matters of food for himself and the laughing maniac by his side. He did not try to navigate after the first bold flight, for the reaction had taken something out of his soul. Then came the storm of April 2nd, in a gathering of the clouds about his consciousness. There is a sense of spectral whirling through liquid gulfs of infinity, of dizzying rides through reeling universes on a comet's tail, and of hysterical plunges from the pit to the moon, and from the moon back again to the pit, all livened by a catching chorus of distorted, hilarious elder gods and the green bat-wing mocking imps of Tartarus. Out of that dream came rescue, the vigilant the Vice Admiralty Court, the streets of Dunedin, and the long voyage back home to the old house by the Eggeberg. He could not tell they would think him mad. He would write of what he knew before death came, but his wife must not guess. Death would be a boon if only he could blot out the memories. That was the document I read, and now I have placed in this tin box beside the boss relief the papers of Professor Angel. With it shall go the record of mine. This test of my own sanity wherein is pieced together that which I hope may never be pieced together again. I have looked upon all that the universe has to hold of horror, and even the skies of spring and the flowers of summer must ever afterward be poison to me. But I do not think my life will be long. As my uncle went, as poor Johansson went, so shall I go. I know too much, and the cult still lives. Cthulhu still lives too, I suppose. Again, in that chasm of stone which has shielded him since the sun was young, 
His accursed city is sunken once more, for the vigilants sailed over that spot after the April storm, but his ministers on earth still below and prance and slay around idle-capped monoliths in lonely places. He must have been trapped by the sinking whilst within his black abyss, or else the world would by now be screaming with fright and frenzy. Who knows the end? What has risen may sink, and what has sunk may rise. Loathsomeness awaits in dreams in the deep, and decay spreads over the tottering cities of men. A time will come, but I must not and cannot think. Let me pray that, if I do not survive this manuscript, my executors may put caution before audacity and see that it meets no other eye. In the story, Cthulhu is described as being a dragon, squid type of thing with feelers on their face. And so we never really given like a, an actual description, but there are some weird little bits and bobs that, that the fandom has put together over the years. And you can Google it and see just a bazillion different kinds of Cthulhu, but they all pretty much have this tentacly face thing and is green. Those are the descriptions were given even in brief. So I started painting her skin green and it felt right until I started, you know, really developing it later on and seeing that perhaps a little bit more of a human skin tone will make this a little bit more <laughs> identifiable because right now uh, it, it may just look like Cthulhu has red hair and, so, <laughs> um, and the, the mermaid tail that comes up out of the water kind of sells it as well but but the prince is standing on the prow of the ship turned to meet Cthulhu as they did in the story, the alert is turned about and they ram Cthulhu's great gelatinous belly and it destroys him utterly, but he begins to reform immediately. But by then, the alert is skedaddle out of there. They have decided, eh, I don't want to wait around to see what the sequel is. Let him reform and just hang out here in the middle of the freaking Pacific. You know, as I read that, I'm sure no one was like severely quaking in their boots or anything. It's not meant to be like Michael Myers Halloween horror scary. It's a lot different. It's a horror without rules. Cosmic horror is like the difference between the movie Alien and the movie Aliens. Cosmic horror is like Alien. We don't know the rules. We know we're definitely got the underhand. We're terrified of all these things we don't understand. Strange geometries, great old ones, a place in the universe that is completely insignificant compared to all these other powers. And then we arrive at Aliens 2. Aliens is a film more action-y than anything else. You know the rules now. I mean, you get these other horror films and you actually know how to fight back against the monster. You know perhaps what to do because now science is involved. And so Alien, you're terrified of this alien. You only see it around corners. You almost never get a glimpse of it. It's ravaging things. You're not even sure what its weaknesses are. But in Aliens, you know, there's guns, there's nukes, there's steam hatches, whatever, the rules are more defined. So cosmic horror combined with Disney princess yields this kind of weirdness in that I gave her kind of a somber kind of dopey look like she just woken up and she's just like raising a hand maybe to squash or maybe to grab or maybe I don't know what's going on in her face, but it felt a little bit like she was raising up and trying to figure out what she was going to do about this. So there's a lot of blue and green in this thing, and I had to really push the red in her hair and the red on the ship to kind of balance out in a color harmony way, because there's a whole lot of her that could be lost in those waves, in the greenness. And I really start to solve some of that with some high contrast lightning and some darkening of shapes, because it ought to be really spooky. The shape on the sails of this ship is actually hearkening back to something called the Elder Sign. It's a glyph that H.P. Lovecraft himself designed as part of the mythos of this universe. You know, it's like an important symbol to fight against these great old ones and their overwhelming nature. Basically, the only thing that they thought they could fight back with was magic, and this Elder Sign was part of it. And so I, I jammed that on the sail, but it's kind of like a, an homage, but it, it's actually kind of an ugly symbol. I didn't know what else to do with it, but it's on there for good or ill. Lovecraft himself was actually pretty tortured. It seems like everyone I enjoy reading, whether it's Mary Shelley, Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft, they're all kind of tortured. He grew up in his parents. One of them went mad and the other one died. So he was raised by ants who eventually went mad. His wife 
his her father went mad and possibly from syphilis and whatever there was a whole lot of weird madness going on and it kind of shaped hp lovecraft's early life to be more and more depressed and prone to crazy bouts of ticks and anguish and as such he hated most of his school probably got bullied because he's a weird guy and pretty intelligent but it kind of brought out in him this need to attack normalcy he didn't want to just tell the normal scary story he wanted to tell the cosmic horror story but he didn't become famous for it until after he died so in the end i think we've come up with the strangest of these disney princess videos yet it is uh, bizarre in the way we created it um it really pushes the antagonist into the background and makes the monster like absolutely monstrous and in a way it's as different from the other ones as hp lovecraft's writing is to all other horror genre writing i think i'm proud of us good job guys this is the part of the video where I ask you to go ahead and find the thumbs up button down there and like it. It's very important to me. And if you like it but haven't subscribed, please hit the subscribe button. Also very important to my self-esteem. And if you've subscribed but don't really know when these videos come out, there's a bell down there as well. If you hit the bell, YouTube will notify you when I get a new video coming out. Also, don't forget to share it. I like to share things with people that I like. And also, create. Create something especially if it's a better day for someone else.